Hi, and welcome to City Desk, a behind the scenes look at Santa Barbara's top local news stories. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts, joined by an all star lineup of local journalists for an inside look at these stories. Santa Barbara's historic district election races for city council are heating up, and it's time to vote early, if not often. From five points to the funk zone, developers enter the bizarre world of city design review. The soups get a glimpse of America's raging war over immigration, and a new state law pretends yet another big change for local voters. Joining me to discuss these issues from high atop the luxurious South Salina Street World Headquarters of TV Santa Barbara, investigative reporter Melinda Burns, Kelsey Brueger, staff writer for The Independent, Josh Molina, who covers politics and policy for Newshawk, and Nick Welsh from the Santa Barbara Independent. Thanks to you all for coming. Well, Nick, we have uh, district elections for the first time in 50 years, no, 60 years. years, and you covered that. I was there. Then. I was there. there. And I you remember have, it. Uh, you have a big cover piece. <laughs> oh, never mind. <laughs> At the end of it. Okay. This was a field. This is where okay. the Kruber right. used to be. Yeah, and big big cover piece there, and hard hitting. <laughs> Oh, okay, so vote by mail ballots uh, are going out Monday. Monday. It's the only kind we I have anymore. Fifth. Everybody has to, to vote by mail. So what are the stories to watch between now and November 3rd? Lord have mercy. Mattresses. M mattresses? mattresses? That is it. The big story, if you listen to the candidates, is mattresses are being dumped on the streets of Santa Barbara in record numbers. And what is going to be done about it? Um, this year is uh, the year of the small. There's no big overarching theme, no bright line in the sand issue, what, line are you, what side are you on issue. It's, it's very district by district, but there is a certain commonality. A, we've been neglected. The east side and the west side, there's a whole lot of neglect. We have been neglected by City Hall, and we're not going to take any more. And mattresses, graffiti, speeding cars, people who are parking in our neighborhood taking up our streets who don't live here, um, we want something done. That's what the issues are. And you're covering it for Newshawk. What are the what are the big races? Well, I took a picture today of one of those mattresses on the east side, and I thought, well, it's kind of great little illustration of what's happening. Uh, it, it, you're right; it's very different than it has been uh, in years past. You know, typically you have candidates, and they're talking about balancing the general fund budget deficit, the shortfall, and uh, this time it. It kind of feels like uh, the early rounds of American, I American Idol in an audition. Like you don't know if these candidates are the ones who are going to make it. Or they're showing them because these are the candidates who are uh, not the best. You know, they're there for entertainment. It's a, a, a wide sort of uh, a range of candidates, and they're kind of learning as they go in front of everyone. Isn't that a problem, though? That they, I mean, that there aren't. Any overarching issues such as the city budget? I mean, isn't it all just going to be potholes? You know what? I mean, it could, it could be a problem, but you know, every year what we would hear is the homeless. Every year we'd hear, oh my God, we don't have enough cops. And so we would get stampeded into some hysteric frenzy about the street people and the homeless, and we were all supposed to react to it. So it's kind of refreshing, actually, that you have these sort of micro issues this time. I mean, it, it could get kind of messy, like just get to the pothole issue. Right now, when they do street repairs, the city is broken up into six zones. Chris, you didn't know that. And so you go in rotation. So zone one, it takes about five years to do all the streets, and you do zone two, and that's how they do it, and they claim this is efficient. Well, when you have districts, why am I going to let you have your streets claimed? Well, I have to wait 15 years for so my So there's street. seven districts and six zones. So, get so they're going to have to redo the zones? Well, then you have, um, then you have six districts. Uh, what what uh, street uh, cleaning district, uh, zone are you in, do you know? I'm down, no, no I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> what district are you in? Who, who, who's running in? <coughs> I am I'm downtown. No one. No one. No one, okay, all right. So Next over year. where I live, we have Kathy Murillo, who is the incumbent. She is the only Latina ever to be elected by... Uh, the voters of Santa Barbara, um, probably the last Latino Latina in 20 some years. Um, what about Gil Garcia? I think if you do the math, he's probably 20 years ago. Really? It's close. Um, it's been a and, while. We've and, been around a yeah, long time. We so the, the weird thing <laughs> is, 
the weird thing is, is that the people who brought us the district elections lawsuit in the first place, because it, the district, the, the council wasn't represented enough, went to Sharon Byrne, a white woman, and said, you should run against this Latina. So that's the big race, really. That's the, that's, that's the that's, money. That's, Kathy Murray over That's Sharon where the Byrne. real drama is. And well, that's, that's district that's two, three. 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 Well, that's where we have these characters, but <coughs> the east side, District 1, is probably the most interesting just in terms of we know we're going to get a Hispanic candidate representing the east side. It's guaranteed uh, all the candidates are Hispanic. Uh, but I want to go back to your other point, which is, you know, there's no big issue. Is that really, does that say anything, though, about the, the quality of the candidate, that they're not able to articulate what those big citywide issues are? No, I, I think um, with the east side in particular, uh, I mean, they had Doss Williams, who uh, was a council member there. You know, he lived in the east side for about a year, maybe yeah, a year and a half. He had a cup of coffee before he had a cup of coffee. Yeah, 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 he ran for soup and then said, well, never mind. They've <laughs> had the least representation. So for the east side, they have a lot of uh, ground to catch up, and, and so the fact that they're all focused on their district and we need to have some love, that makes sense. Um, I think, though, the whole election has a feel of sort of a costume party that was called at the last minute, and you can only make the costume with what you have in your closet. You can't buy anything. And so you have these people who are kind of coming out of the woodwork. I mean, Jackie Inda, she, she claimed, oh, I was trying to find somebody to run. Um, you have uh, Jason Dominguez, who has done everything under the sun. He even helped prosecute uh, Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to get back okay. to Slobodan on the next time. When but we you have all these people that this. nobody's ever heard of, um, and they're kind of figuring it out as they go. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, it, it could be messy. It'll be interesting. Who's going to win, uh, a Burn or uh, uh, Kathy? I would say uh, Kathy should win it, but... Kathy or Sharon? Kathy. Kathy or Sharon? Kathy should win. Uh, she's the incumbent. Uh, Sharon is stronger on the east side. She'd be a better candidate on that side. Kathy or Sharon? Kathy. <coughs> Wrong. Sharon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Josh. <laughs> that, was my, that was my John McLaughlin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You've been writing, Josh, a lot about the uh, Alice in Wonderland goings-on at the Architectural Review Board, the ARB, for those of you keeping track, uh, including uh, some controversial plans for that historic landmark, the Big Five Store. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on over there? Well, I love covering ABR meetings. A lot of times you, it's, a, it's an issue that comes up early on in the planning process, and I like covering the stuff that's early before it's done and it's too late to say anything. So with the Big Five uh, project, these are the developers of the Five Point Shopping Center who wanted to go in there and put in a whole bunch of murals. They wanted to work with the community to have a, one big uh, student mural out there. And then they had all of these decorative sort of mo motifs around Big Five. They wanted a flag. There's a banner program. Uh, and uh, some of the things that caught the ABR's attention were, were uh, you know, they had a, a big, a big lizard, a, a big uh, whale uh, riding a bicycle. Uh, these sort of mix and matching things that don't go together. It's sort known of as surrealism, I believe. Or whimsical. <laughs> whimsical. Is the term, yes. So, so as we know, we're here in San Stock art. <laughs> also. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when you're a developer, you think, "Wow, this is a great idea. We can come in here. We've done this other places." But as people find out that. Santa Barbara is very different when it comes to their so design principles. Well, funny thing was the ABR, they reviewed this. It also went to Arts Commission. They reviewed it. The developers went to the ABR. They thought they were going to get final approval, and the ABR decided, no, we don't really like this. Uh, we want you to come back. We want you to change it, take some of this away, move it. The developer felt like he had been sort of blindsided here at the end of the project, and he got up and he, uh, you know, he said, we're done. We're, we're not going to continue with this, which is really unusual because most of the time, if you know Santa Barbara, you play the game, you work, you go back and forth. Uh, Where's the developer from? I don't know. Um, uh, they have a lot of shopping. Not local, though. 
No, and I, I think it's, um, they're not even California. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. They didn't want to build anything, right? They just wanted to paint the building, essentially. Yeah, they wanted lots of paint, lots of color. It's things like uh, they wanted to paint tiles. I mean, it's such a distinctive ABR. and distinguished building <laughs> as well, it is. There's I some know. birds on the building. For those who've been to Big Five. Right. There, there are say? some. There's birds on painted on the build, on uh, building. Already? Side. Yeah. Yeah, this would change. Yeah, this would change. They wanted something, as they put it, was uh, we wanted to sort of help people uh, feel when they walk into the shopping mall that there are uh, entry points, access points. You know, they want to activate the space. And, and what were the objections wow. to this? I mean, it's, it's not Santa Barbara, right? Uh, and the big five the big is. Five. I don't. I, I, I always sure. thought that was outside the ABR's purview. Well, th there was some, some debate. The developers sort of felt like, hey, you guys aren't um, reviewers of the artwork, public art. That you have a public arts commission to do that. And so there was some back and forth. But the ABR did determine that they are. But what was interesting was you don't see developers say, if you don't like this, we're done. We've already invested too much time and money into this project. And they, and they walked out. But it, what, what's interesting is it goes to this larger issue is Santa Barbara is Santa Barbara because of a lot of reasons, but we like what you know, we, we like the way it looks. You know, we have people who are in charge of protecting um, our buildings, uh, and and it goes to that class. You come in from outside the area, you don't really have that sense of uh, feeling. Dunkin' Donuts did the same thing. They came in there, they wanted to take down Brian Cornell's, or they wanted to change uh, Brian Cornell's building, and they said, no, we like the arch there because it's Santa Barbara-ish. And you know, Dunkin' Donuts gave out a free cup of coffee. It was National Coffee Day this week. Sorry, it was just for the side. <laughs> But we see it all over all over town, you know. It, um, it's just and and isn't it isn't it a fact that that there's now behavior uh, guidelines being set down for measure for for members of the board? Yeah, uh, just uh, on, uh, recently there was some uh, talk about well, what is the ABR's purview here, and at what point? A after this all happened, yeah, with the just development. very recently, yeah, and. And the ABR got a lecture from Jaime Lamone, to, who basically oversees the ABR about and who is we can't he? be rushing. Who is he? He's uh, I, he might be the senior planner um, in the city of Santa Barbara, but he oversees ABR from a management level. And uh, he said, we can't be rushing these candidates just because you've spent two hours, three hours before and you want to go to dinner. You've got to give them their due time and we have to make sure that everything we tell them to do is within your purview. So lots of those kinds of things. So it's interesting, ABR stuff happens all the time. Um, it's a great opportunity because a lot of the architects will come in with concept reviews and it's a good opportunity for And who's on it? Is it, is it, is it like artists and architects or all architects or? They have architects, they have landscape architects, they have um, at large, they have a good mix of people who have a perspective on how a building should look, building, uh, like design. The like the big five building. I or think. like your favorite building, the 7-Eleven on State Street. Right? That's a good looking building. <laughs> it's huge, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And they sent me a coupon uh, in the mail the other day. A free coffee also. Wow, oh, going national national by the way, none of the candidates <laughs> talking about the ABR, no. by the way. How about big five? So we're a long way from Brian five? Barnwell running for city council, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we, there's a whole bunch of other we got cases and stuff developments. in the yeah, fun we, zone, we, we, housing, we, we, we all over town. Get to those next time. All right, Kelsey. So the fallout continues over this horrible case uh, of an innocent woman murdered up in North County, allegedly by two men, one of whom is in the country illegally. And the soups had a meeting this week on kind of the whole issue of who's in charge here. What what happened? Right, so it was um, about, I mean, it, of course, the, the reason for this hearing, um, it, was, it was put on the agenda by uh, Supervisor Steve Lavagnino was because of this case. Um, uh, though, though at the hearing, it was made painfully clear to everyone there that they were not to be mentioning this particular case or this person who was murdered uh, in July, so much so that, that people during public comment, you know, started referencing her and... Uh, Mrs. Janet, Mrs. Ferris. Right, Marilyn Ferris. Um, and, and Janet Wolf, chair of the board, interrupted people during public comment and reminded them that um, Steve had spoken to um, a 
the, the family, and, and she had asked, you know, not to talk about it. Anyways, it's, uh, it was obvious that they were there for that case, so of course it came up. Um, but the larger point was, what are the laws in place? Um, what are the policies that ICE, uh, immigra uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement has? Um, and how does that work with the local uh, county jails? Um, and, and what are the policies there? So what's happened is that a lot of changes have happened in the last couple of years um, to, to change things a little bit. Um, one of a number of things, um, if you ask uh, the, the sheriff's department and a lot of sheriff's department, um, they, they point to Prop 47, which uh, lowered felony cases to misdemeanors for nonviolent crimes of, of drug use, for instance. The 2014 ballot measure. Last year, right. Um, there are other things, uh, there was the Trust Act um, last year that um, made it so that um, an ICE official, if they were to, if they wanted to put an ICE hold or request a detainer on a particular individual, um, a, a sheriff would, would take that as a request. Um, they wouldn't have to comply if they didn't want to, and further, they could be sued um, if, they, if they held someone longer than no the local Because there's no due process sentence. because right. the and judge hasn't ordered it. Right. So, um, a lot of a lot of confusing things happening. I mean, the question with this case was, of course, that this person had been in the county jail or had been released from the county jail. I think it was four days, three days before um, this murder happened. So a lot of people are wondering. He, he's had he has a criminal record, not not an extensive one um, or, or not a significant crime. You know, it was drug. Uh, drug uses and he, but he had been arrested I think five times in the last 15 months six times in the last 15 months so that's kind of significant so so it's a lot but it's a lot of little ones um, is what it was there, there were definitely a trend though def definitely a trend so we have, yeah people were wondering people were asking questions how is it that someone um, you know slipped through the cracks basically um, so and it got this got a, the case got a lot of national attention it did it did and it was on the heels of one um, the the horrible one in San Francisco so um, you know, and, and you know, obviously immigration is a is a hot issue right now. Obviously, Donald Trump is bringing it up um, in the presidential race, um, so people are are um, talking about. How it. is the board split on the issue? Well, the board. I mean, last week the board didn't take any action, so there was no. Um, there was a lot of questions being asked. You know, peop the board wasn't necessarily voicing their opinion. I mean, you know, of course. Um, North County is um, more conservative. Um, the two supervisors in the North County and the, the three um, in the South are um, more liberal. I mean, they're nonpartisan seats, but um, so. I mean, it, it, what you saw was you saw people showing up, dozens of people showing up to the boardroom um, on, you know, complete opposite sides of the issue. You have some people saying, you know, I can't believe that these people are being um, deported and they haven't done anything. And then you have some people, you know, who are living in the same community saying, um, you know, no one's been deported. And so um, a lot of, of very different perceptions about what's going on. And there have been some recent sweeps, So there have been saying. some recent sweeps. Um, ICE doesn't like to call it sweeps. They call it uh, enforcement surges, I believe. Um. Better. <laughs> Sounds way better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so more well like that. Yeah. So there was one um, that was widely reported in, in late August, a four day sweep, two hundred and forty four <coughs> people in seven Southern California counties, uh, twenty people in Santa Barbara, mostly Santa Maria. Um, there was this most recent one, which was 30 days, and um, there were 49 people in Santa Barbara County. I don't know the numbers for the entire Southern California area, but um, so they, they have, I mean, and again, back to Prop 47, um, back, to, back to AB 109, the, the prison realignment measure. Um, so the, the thinking from ICE officials is, is that more people are being released from county jails. Um, so well, good work on this story because it's really complicated. Isn't it a fact, Melinda? And I, I know you'll agree with me here. This problem is never going to get solved unless there's a path to citizenship for the 11 million uh, people who were here illegally. Isn't that isn't that true? Yeah, uh, immigration law is, is very Byzantine and somewhat um, uh, dictatorial. It's it, it, it's very undemocratic and. Uh, it's a civil rights issue, and I think, sure. And the thing is, with Trump and all these guys, 
it's just they're, they're doing exactly what the leaders of the National Republican Party don't want them to do, which is that they're just really being inflammatory with the rhetoric and, and, and the, turning up the, the, the rhetoric. And it finds a, an audience somewhere in America, quite millions of them. Isn't this why we had the Civil War, though? Maybe Lincoln should have. Well, anyway, we won't go there. All right. So, Melinda, we were talking earlier about how district elections is kind of shaking up local politics. And now you write, uh, there's another big change that's looming out there. What is it? And what claims are the advocates making? Well, this could be the last district election that will be held in a an odd year or off cycle from statewide elections, which are held in even numbered years. And the big issue is voter participation. So if you look at the average of the last four municipals, turnout, you get 40% of registered voters in Santa Barbara. If Which is really good Come for uh, what, off year what, what was the number? Um, the, the average is about 41. That is so, good. but there were three, there were a couple years in the 30s, you know, one that was close to 50 in the last four years. Um, and then you compare that to Santa Barbara turnout in statewide elections, the last four statewides, and it's 75%. So we know that more people go out in statewide elections, and they, you know, the reason may be simple. They just hear more about it, there's more publicity, there are more issues being discussed, more candidates, and so why not shift those elections? To, to even years, um, municipal elections to even years. And now there's a law which signed by the governor on September 1st that as of January 1st, 2018, any voter in a jurisdiction that holds an odd year election, um, actually the way the, the, the law is, 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 is written it's retroactive, and a voter could sue now, except that the law the doesn't go into effect. voter could sue to say what? I mean, what's um, the case they're making? That, that for, low, for low voter turnout, and the formula is that if, if um, low turnout is turnout that is 25 points lower than I see. the average of the last four statewides. Is it apples to apples, though? Because, so you have 75% turnout. Do we know that we're going to have that kind of turnout in a city council district election? Because the argument, one of the arguments, has always been when it's off year, these local Santa Barbara elections get all the attention they deserve as opposed to being down ballot on a presidential year and all these sure. other statewide things. Um, so. I just wonder if you, you know, at least all we're talking about right now are Santa Barbara district elections, mm -hmm. you know? So I wonder if there's some other side of that in terms of it getting lost in the shuffle. Isn't this, a, isn't this really just a plot by the Democratic Party? It is a plot by the Democrats, um, but it's actually a pretty good plot. I mean, what was it, seven years ago, I think, there was a ballot measure to do justice. I think David Pritchett was in charge. Um, the, the police Hus union, husband of Kathy Maria. Husband, ex-husband of Kathy Maria. Um, I think the police union was opposed to it. Uh, the firefighters union was opposed to it. The independent came out against it. The news press came out against it. It what went are you down. Pointing to me. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is that about? <laughs> I, you were there. I could continue your uh, point. And uh, <laughs> it went down. And I think this time around, it, the, the results will be very different. And I think the Democrats, um, I mean, yeah, the Democrats are going to benefit disproportionately. If, if voter turnout goes up, Republicans are pretty high, you know, they're loyal voters, they're going to go to the polls almost no matter what, or to a greater extent than Democrats. <coughs> the off -year, the on -year, um statewide elections really benefit the, the Democratic turnout. And so the Republicans on the, on the city council are saying, why, why do we want to do this? This is just a freebie to the Rockefeller Mall Hall and the Democratic Party so that they, they can get their candidates elected. Who's going to get screwed on the council? Somebody's going to end up with a short term. So term. the way it may, it may play out is that since Santa Barbara's a charter city, 
then the voters will have to put it, it will have to pass it on a. Ooh, more elections. We can talk. So that it may be on the ballot in 2016. Yeah. And. We'll uh, get an extra year. That uh, means that that four people on the council will get. Four an people extra will year. get an extra. Year. Who would get an extra? Year? So uh, Helene Schneider. Um, well, she'll be in Washington. Oh, no. Frank Hotchkiss, Andy White, and uh, Greg Hart. Well, that won't be altogether a bad thing. No, I mean, every I mean, city. They, those are citywide people, and yeah. it allows for an easier transition, maybe, into district. I think but Los Angeles does shift it. I mean, one interesting thing is, if you just look at the um, breakdown for Anglo and Latino vote, and you compare uh, 2013 municipal to 2012 statewide for Santa Barbara registered voters, you get 80% um, of Anglo's registered voters voting in the statewide compared to 40%, so it goes down by half in municipal. But for Latinos, it's 75% of registered Latinos in statewide goes down to 25, so it goes down by two thirds. So is it your so, sense that, so the, it's go a, ahead. It's for, you know, voter participation across the board, but it's particularly critical for minority votes. Which is good for Democrats. Yeah. So is it your sense that somebody's going to have to file a suit on this or that the council just put it on the ballot? I can't say. I mean, I, I think that it's probably going to go on the ballot. It, it went on the ballot in uh, Ventura and Los Angeles, passed overwhelmingly, like within the last year, both of those cities. Palmdale, the judge, the, uh, Palmdale w was sued over district elections and the judge required them to go to even mm -hmm. year. So it seems it's a trend. I mean, only like 23% of the cities in the state still have odd year elections. But what's interesting in the uh, Negotiations between the city council and the uh, plaintiffs in the district election suit. This issue came up, and there was some talk about well, maybe we should make the switch now because that was just it makes sense. But within the plaintiffs, there was disagreement. Um, they didn't want to do that because they thought this was going to be um, a gift to the Democratic Party, and they thought we're not interested in being you know uh, the tail end of their comment. I got it. We got to go. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, the five of us will probably sit here for, oh, I don't know, 12 or 13 more hours discussing <laughs> the process of elections in Santa Barbara, which is uh, So thank you again for watching City Desk. Please check us out on SB City Desk uh, on Facebook and on Twitter. And uh, if you will be the 500th like on our Facebook page, we have great gifts. Uh, for you. We have, we're up to 473 now. Hap Freund, our producer, and I uh, want to get to 500. We're not quite sure why, but maybe <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg has a surprise for us. So please do that, and uh, we'll let you know next time what the gifts are going to be once we figure them out. So thanks again for watching City Desk. Uh, good night. <laughs>